Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome to the class of Public International Law. The topic that we will discuss now is State Responsibility. I am Dr. Ashutosh Acharya, Senior Assistant Professor, Law Center 2, Faculty of Law, University of Delhi. Well friends, this is one of the most important topic that we will discuss today because this is the only topic that talks about the liability regime. We have discussed subjects of international law and we have discussed that states, international organizations are the subjects of international law primarily and out of which states are the ones who take the shots, who are the ones which decide that what international law with which they will be bound either through practice or by accepting obligations through treaty law or under conventions. So, provided there is any kind of international obligation to be performed on the part of the state is concerned and if there is any breach of any such international obligation, then what is the recourse? And not only that, how to identify that the state is responsible? What is the method through which we identify that states are responsible? Not only that, we see that states are an abstract body. They act through their representatives, whether the representatives belonged to that particular state. How to identify that those individuals, those representatives were acting on behalf of the state? All of this is to be understood under the topic of a state responsibility. Here, we try to identify that in what all scenarios and circumstances a state can be held responsible. We will discuss the governing law as far as a state responsibility is concerned, which helps us to identify that whether a state responsible, whether the circumstances that we are talking about fall within the domain of state responsibility, can they be attributed the responsibility for the acts committed by some individual? All of this will be discussed in this topic that is the state responsibility. Well, friends, the learning objectives for us would be to understand the regime of law of a state responsibility, to view different scenarios of a state liability to learn about the process of attribution of liability, to learn the application of responsibility to protect, to understand the regime of reparations, to learn the defenses available to preclude the responsibility of a state. So, especially if you look at the learning objective wherein we say to learn the application of responsibility to protect. This signifies that it is not only the act, the active part of the act which leads to state responsibility, but a state responsibility can also be endured wherever there is breach due to omission as well. And we will understand this particular aspect also in detail. Well, as far as the theoretical basis of responsibility of a state is concerned. We see that in general, responsibility can be endured upon any legal personality on two bases or by using any of the two bases. One of the bases is based on fault and the other basis does not take into account fault, but only the breach. Wherein, if you look at fault, it includes the fault aspect. So, 
Let us look at these two approaches. Principle of objective theory that is risk theory. Liability of the state is strict in nature. That is, we do not look at the actual intention whether a state was intending to do it or a state was not intending to do it. So, we do not basically go and look into the fault. We only look for duty, breach of duty and then we look for damage caused by that particular breach of duty. And as a result, the strict liability can be imposed upon the state. The second approach is subjective responsibility concept. The element of intention, dolus as we also say or negligent conduct on the part of the person is to be identified. Here we actually go and look for fault. The larger accepted theory is principle of objective that is objective theory is the largely accepted theory because it is very difficult to go and look into the intention of the state and more than that it is difficult to prove intention of the state while any wrongful act is either attributed or claimed or alleged against a particular state. Let us look at and understand this particular aspect through a certain cases. First is near claim 1926. In this particular claim, well there were number of claims after a particular incident happened in early 20th century, there were certain crimes that were committed against US citizens, the claims settlement commission was formed. But in this particular case here, a specific incident has occurred and this incident is that an American superintendent of a Mexican mine was shot. United States of America on behalf of the widow and the daughter claimed damages because of lackadaisical manner in which the Mexican authorities pursued their investigations. The General Claims Commission disallowed in applying objective test as they wanted to go and look into the dolus aspect, the intentional aspect or you can say the actual intentional negligence. So, therefore, in this case we see non-application of objective test rather application of subjective theory. Whereas, if you look at Corfu channel case of 1949 between UK and Albania, wherein we see that UK ships were crossing through Corfu channel situated near Albania or that comes within the control of Albania, got damaged due to coming into contact with certain mines that were laid in Corfu channel during the second world war. Albania negligently did not remove those mines as claimed by UK in this particular case and as a result UK ships had faced damages. Now here Albania argued that it was not aware of those mines being placed in the Corfu channel and as a result they also claimed or as a second secondary argument they also claimed that they did not do it intentionally. Certainly from the facts we can identify that Albania was not intentionally negligent or you can say did not do it intentionally as far as the laying down of mines and the destruction of the ships of UK are concerned. But then court that is International Court of Justice in this case applied objective theory that Albania was duty bound. It was the duty of the coastal state to take care of any harm present within its waters. So, it was the duty of the Albania to take care that no harm is present within its waters which can cause damage to any other ship. So, we can say that there was duty of the Albania which was breached by Albania and as a result damage was caused to the ships of United Kingdom and therefore, Albania was held responsible in this particular case. Now, these are 
the cases or these are the two cases that we identified wherein two types of theories were made applicable. However, we have now moved a step ahead of these theories and now have a concretized codified legislated draft of articles of a state responsibility of 2001. These articles of a state responsibility acts as a governing law, not necessarily that they govern all kind of situations and are binding, but it helps these articles that we are talking about helps the court to identify that whether a particular state was responsible in the facts or in a particular incident which has been claimed by one state against another state. It is these articles that now concretize and objectify that how a particular state can be made responsible, how wrong, for a wrongful act of a particular state responsibility can be attributed upon that particular state. So, imputation of liability, attribution and discussions about representatives of particular organ, whether organ of the state, whether a particular representative is the organ of a state or not an organ of the state, whether a particular act was committed to by committed by a state, how to understand that imputation of liability can be made upon a state can be clearly understood through these articles of a state responsibility. As I said prepared by International Law Commission, the articles of a state responsibility came in 2001 and they are guidelines as far as state responsibility or the regime of a state responsibility is concerned, they act as a guideline to impute liability or responsibility upon the state. They also act as guideline to save one's acts that is to preclude, that is to argue in defense as far as any imputation of liability is concerned. They also talk about reparation regime as far as any liability if imputed, if proved against a particular state. So, if you look at articles of a state responsibility, it is divided into three parts. Part 1 talks about origin of international responsibility, part 2 talks about content, forms and degree of international responsibility and part 3 talks about settlement of disputes and the implementation of international responsibility. Now, articles of a state responsibility firstly identifies internationally wrongful act what acts can be considered to be internationally wrongful. Unless and until we categorize a particular act to be internationally wrongful, we cannot make a particular state responsible for its act. So, it has to be a wrongful act first. So, therefore, article 1 says every internationally wrongful act of a state entails the international responsibility of that state. Now, where do you find international law? Because once international law is breached, we can say that a state has committed internationally wrongful act. International law can either be found in international treaties or international agreement of any other nature, international conventions or customary international law, international customs, peremptory norms of international law, use cogens or certain obligations which are erga omnes in nature. So, whenever any international law falling in any of the category as I have just mentioned is violated, we can say that a particular state has committed internationally wrongful act. And therefore, for every internationally wrongful act as a result, the state entails the international responsibility of that state. Second, it talks about breach of an international obligation. So, as I said, under either international treaty, international convention or any type of international agreement, peremptory norms of international law, use cogens, ergominous obligations or international custom, if there is breach of any provision or breach of any particular practice recognized under custom or peremptory norm of international law, then such breach would amount to internationally wrongful act. So, obligations can be derived from all these regimes of the international legal system. Now, as we know that a state is an abstract body, it is not body that is present that can be that we can see, but representation of a state is done by 
certain individuals. And those individuals, when they represent the state, are having certain rights as well as they have certain duties while they represent. And while they represent, if they commit any internationally wrongful act, then in such a scenario, for those acts which are committed by individuals, the state can be held responsible. So when such a state is responsible for the acts of individual, we say that there is attribution of responsibility. So the, the principle of vicarious liability to a certain extent we see gets applicable here that for the acts of agent, principle can be held responsible. And similarly here also we see that under rule of attribution for the acts of agent, for the acts of a representative, the state can be held responsible. So therefore, article 2 as a normative operation talks about rule of attribution. Whose acts can be attributed upon the state? So article 4 identifies certain organs or it says the acts of organs of a state, I repeat it says, article 4 says that the acts of organs can be attributed upon the state and if the acts are wrongful in nature, that means the wrongful act will be attributed upon the state and if a wrongful act is attributed upon the state for any breach of uh, international obligation, then we can say that a state has committed an internationally wrongful act. Now when we say it can, act of the organ of the state can be attributed upon the state, what do we mean by the word organ of the state? Article 4 tries to simplify, tries to exemplify, tries to make us understand what do we mean by the word organ of the state. So largely or you can say generally organ of the state can include legislative organ, executive organ or judiciary. And it further says any other de facto organ of the state. So we see that in almost all these states, there are three basic organs and that is legislative organ, executive organ or the judiciary. These are the primary organs of the state and if any internationally wrongful act is committed by any of these organs by virtue of their acts, either by passing a law or by taking certain executive action or by passing a judgment, which is breach or violation of international obligation, then a state can be held responsible for the internationally wrongful act. But largely we see it is not these three acts, these three organs which directly come into action. Out of these three organs we see it is largely, it is mostly the executive organ that comes into interface between national aspects and international aspects. It is the executive organ that largely takes part, takes part in international activities. And we see that wherever such executive representation at international fora comes into being and if there is any internationally wrongful act committed by that particular organ, then we can say that the state has committed internationally wrongful act. So we also see that apart from these three organs, there are other de facto organs. And when we say de facto organs, that is by factual scenario, if apart from these three organs, a particular representative, a particular individual has been endowed with authority to represent the state at an international fora in some other state, then the state can be held responsible. So there can be any other number of de facto organs as well, which represent a particular state, which acts on behalf of the state. Even if the state has not sent them to represent them, but when certain individuals are supported by the state, when certain individuals or group of individuals are supported by the state directly or sometimes indirectly, then also we can bring a connection between those individuals or group of individuals and a state. So it is not that simple when we say that a state whether has sent it or not. So a state is, a state can be held responsible or a breach of obligation can be attributed upon the state only if a state has sent so. Sometimes a state not expressly recognizes it. Yes, a state does send them. Yes, a state recognizes them as their representative, but not openly, only under the wheel or sometimes not disclosed. So sometimes on the, on, on the face of it or on the periphery or at the outset, they consider a particular group 
or individuals or states consider a particular group of individuals or individuals or a particular individual to not to be a representative or not to be acting on behalf of that particular state. And once a wrongful act is committed, the state will be then in a position to avoid any kind of international responsibility that can be attributed upon the state for the acts of that group of individual or individual. In such scenario, the opposite party or the claimant party can bring or draw a connection between that individual or group of individual and the state. Once that connection is established, we can say that this particular group of individual or individual was the organ of the state. So, the expansioning or expansioning of the organ of the state can also take place by state recognizing. Apart from that, we also understand that internal laws can also identify who can be organ of the state apart from the primary three organs of the state that is legislative, executive or judicial bodies. We look at La Grand case that is between Germany and United States of America in 2001, wherein breach of international obligation was committed by the governor of Arizona. Well friends, United States of America is a federal state, governor of Arizona does not represent the state internationally, but was bound under certain international law to act. And this binding character flow from Vienna Convention on Consular Relations 1963, Article 22, Article 36 especially of the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations 1963 imposes a binding obligation upon the state to provide for counselor access to any citizen which has been detained or is in prison under any crime that he or she has committed or for any matter of execution. Wherever such counselor access is not provided to the individuals who are detained in a foreign country, then in such a situation we can say there is breach of international obligation. What is the international obligation? As I have just told you, Article 36 of Vienna Convention on Consular Relations 1963 was the binding obligation on United States of America in Lagrand case. Because in this particular case, we see that there were two brothers, Karl Lagrand and Walter Lagrand, who were German citizens, they got to know at a later point of time, that is, after they were convicted for homicide. Now, here the governor of Arizona was supposed to stop the execution and enforce Article 36 of Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. Now, once you know about the rights of a foreign citizen, it must be protected, whereas they were executed and the information to councils was given later. So, when such execution took place, the order to halt the execution was already reached. However, and also at the same time, governor of Arizona was aware of such rights, but did not fulfill the obligation. And as a result, here the governor of Arizona is acting as the organ of the state and the state that is United States of America can be held responsible for the breach of provision of Vienna Convention on Consular Relations 1963. So, we see that who can be an organ is to be identified from Article 4. From the understanding of Article 4, we can deduce the organ of the state. And once that is done, we can impute the acts of that particular organ upon the state. Article 5 of the Articles of State Responsibility says, conduct of persons or entities exercising elements of governmental authority. It says, the conduct of a person or entity which is not an organ of the state under Article 4, but which is empowered by the law of that state to exercise elements of governmental authority shall be considered an act of the state under international law, provided the person or entity is acting in that capacity in the particular instance. So friends, as I have already told you that not necessarily that it will always be legislative organ, executive organ or judiciary. There may be some other organs also which can act 
on behalf of the state and when a state recognizes them directly or indirectly to be acting on behalf of the state either expressly or impliedly also they can also be considered to be organ of the state and their conduct can be considered to be conduct of the person conduct of the state as the title of article 5 says conduct of persons or entities exercising elements of governmental authorities i would give you an example of this particular aspect that wherein when the revolution happened in iran and revolutionary guards took over a major public functions different types of functions in iran after the revolution then or after the change of regime then we see a certain acts that were undertaken by revolutionary guards against foreign nationals were considered to be acts of the state though there was no direct order there was no direct document or express document or notification that identified them as to be acting in governmental authority however their acts were later on approved by the government that is a different aspect but at that point of time also when they were acting and they also continued to act their acts at a certain point of time and after a certain point of time were considered to be governmental acts also we see sometimes that there are private security firms which perform public functions and when these private security firms registered in some state act on behalf of the state their acts can be considered to be conduct of the state and they these private firms will then be in that situation be considered to be organ of the state apart from that we also have united nations peacekeeping forces now these united nations peacekeeping forces are is a force which is made out of combination of different individuals so citizens of different countries or military personnel of different countries are deputed to work at united nations organization and act as un peace keepers and together they, it is called as united nations peacekeeping forces now in that situation can we say that for a wrongful act that is committed by let's say a certain battalion which co which comes from india and is acting in a certain conflict war zone region will india be responsible for any wrongful act that is done by the battalion acting at a war zone or in a conflict zone no since it is representing or acting on behalf of united nations organization it will be united nations organization that will be held responsible for any wrongful act that is that if is committed by such un peacekeeping forces article 6 further says or talks about conduct of organs placed at the disposal of a state by another state now this is a situation wherein a particular state hands over its forces to another state now what happens if these forces commits wrongful act in the receiving state and these breaches are breaches of international obligations so article 6 says the conduct of an organ placed at the disposal of a state by another state shall be considered an act of the former state under international law i repeat the conduct of an organ placed at the disposal of the state by another state so if there are two states state a and state b the state a sends force to state b then what will happen if the forces commits an internationally wrongful act then it says at the disposal of a state by another state shall be considered an act of the former state that is at whose disposal the forces have been sent that is here in a between a and b it is the b at whose disposal the forces have been sent under international law if the organ is acting in the exercise of elements of the governmental authority of the state at whose disposal it is placed now the basic reason behind this particular provision and identification of responsibility of the receiving state is that it is the receiving state who is actually in control of those forces and it is the receiving state who can who is who will then be responsible for any wrongful act that that particular force has undertaken or committed article 7 says excess of authority or contravention of instructions the conduct of an organ of a state or of a person or entity empowered to exercise elements 
of the governmental authority shall be considered an act of the state under international law if the organ, person or entity acts in that capacity even if it exceeds its authority or contravenes instructions. So, when we say and read article 6 that the acts must be under governmental authority, what if the acts are beyond governmental authority? Can the state take defense of the fact that the wrongful act committed by certain forces, certain individuals are beyond governmental authority? The answer is no. The state cannot take any such defense when the acts are beyond governmental authority also. Even if it is beyond governmental authority, the only requirement is to establish linkage between the body that is acting and the state. Once the linkage is established, even if the acts are beyond governmental authority, the state can be held responsible for the excess of authority or contravention of instructions. Article 8 talks about conduct directed or controlled by a state. This is one of the very important provisions because it identifies all those situations wherein there is an indirect involvement of a state no direct involvement, no express mention, no express recognition, but an indirect intervention by the state or indirect breach of obligation by the state. In such situation, things become quite subjective in nature because there is absence of express recognition by the state of its organ. Now, for this implied recognition or for the, the, the claimant state has to prove that there is implied connection between the organ and the state. We will understand this through case law as well. As it says, article 8 says, conduct directed or controlled by a state. The conduct of a person or group of persons shall be considered an act of a state under international law if the person or group of persons is in fact acting on the instructions of or under the direction or control of that state in carrying out the conduct. A commentary on ILC articles of international state responsibility says, if directed or controlled, the specific operation and the conduct complained of was an integral part of operation. Now, friends, if you read article 8 again, as it says, the conduct of a person or group of persons shall be considered an act of a state under international law. If the person our group of persons is in fact acting on the instructions of or under the direction. So, these words become important here that is instruction of under the direction or control of that state is carrying out the conduct. These two to three words that is instructions, direction or control are the guideline or are the deciding factor in order to determine that whether a particular body is the organ of the state or not the organ of the state, whether the particular body was acting on behalf of the state or not acting on behalf of the state. This will identify and determine that whether the state is responsible or not responsible. Now, let us understand through a case law which is known as Nicaragua versus United States of America. 1986. In this particular case, we get to know that whether a body which is not directly connected with the state for the actions of that particular body, can the state be held responsible? So, to answer this complex question, let me give you a background of the case first and what jurisprudence comes out of this particular case will be very important for us, it, it became important after this case and it is important even today, so that we can establish responsibility of the states for any internationally wrongful act. Let me give you friends the background of the case first. So, United States of America and Nicaragua were having friendly relations till 1979, because in 1979 we saw overthrown, overthrowing of a government, a government that was already situated or placed in Nicaragua was that of President Somoza. President Somoza was removed by the junta 
and the supporters of Sandinista government. Now, here the junta, new junta government as it removed President Somoza after an armed rebellion. There were concerns in the United States of America with respect to the new government. However, it continued its good relationship with the new government as well in 1980 as well as in 1981. Especially, this can be evidenced by the fact that the US had passed a special budget for aid in Nicaragua. Now, after 1981 or you can say in 1981, we see Nicaragua started interfering in the matters of El Salvador. United States was not happy by this interference in El Salvador and as a result, it suspended its aid and decreased its relationship with Nicaragua. This relationship between both the countries started becoming sour and we also see on the other hand, the supporters of the President Somoza who was removed by the Junta government, the new Junta government, started armed rebellion against the new Junta government. Now, in Nicaragua and around Nicaragua, we see that groups of armed rebellions had been formed. These large groups were known as the Contras. The word Contra comes from this particular incident. These Contras used to conduct secret operations, military operations. These militants, known militants or at least to be militants, used to target certain military setups, used to target certain properties, governmental properties. Their acts led to killing of certain private citizens, individuals, supporters of junta government, military individuals and destruction of property, etc. For all these crimes that were carried out in and against Nicaragua, we see that Nicaragua made United States of America responsible. It claimed that it is the United States of America who is supporting logistically by training them, by supplying them arms and even helping them out with the targets. With such claims, Nicaragua said that the United States of America has breached its international obligation under United Nations Charter that is of non-intervention, that is of territorial integrity, that is of act of aggression and non-intervention in internal matters. United States of America, on the other hand, denied all such allegations. Since these Contras were not nationals of United States of America, they were even not led by any US troops. US troops were not present in and around Nicaragua. US troops were not directly involved in any damage or killings that happened in Nicaragua. So, we need to then identify that whether the claims of Nicaragua are substantiated. If we seek to substantiate these claims, then what do we need to do? We need to connect the wrongful acts with that of USA. And between the wrongful acts, that is destruction of property, killing of people with USA, between these two things, there lies contras. So, if you are able to connect the acts of contras with that of United States of America, then there is a clearly established relationship between USA and these contras. So, how do you do that? So, in order to substantiate that, as I said, Nicaragua went on to argue that the whole operation by contras was financed by USA. USA was involved in training them, equipping them. It was CIA, an organ of United States of America, who went on to pass a special budget, supply with a special budget to these contras, train them and then equipping them also through arms. There was complete dependence of the contras upon United States of America. There was least margin of independence. And when we say there was least margin of independence, we can say that these contras could not have carried out their act, acts or attacks in Nicaragua without the help and support and involvement of United States of America. There was complete control 
of United States of America as far as their acts were concerned. Well, friends, if you, if we seek to make USA responsible for all the acts that were committed in and around Nicaragua, then whether these factors will allow the court to establish relationship between Contras and USA. Court did accept all of these connections to a certain extent, but then it said that we need to look at the control of the organ of the state that is United States of America over these Contras. Whether these Contras could have undertaken all these activities without the support and help specifically of the United States of America or the acts or the attacks could have been conducted even without the help and support of United States of America. So, what is the level of dependence? So, the level of dependence will determine that whether USA had connection with these contrasts which was direct in nature. So, the test that was applied in this case was effective control test. How effective is the control of the state? If the control is effective in nature, only then we can held a particular state to be responsible for the wrongful acts committed here, for the breach of international obligation under the United Nations Charter and other international laws. So, the court found on certain attacks at certain incidences, United States of America to be responsible that were committed till 1984. So, till 1984, court was satisfied by the claims of Nicaragua as far as connection between the Contras and the USA is concerned. But post-1984, USA diluted its policy as far as these claims, these support provided to Contras was concerned. Now, as it diluted its policy, court could not find USA responsible for the acts that were committed by the Contras. And therefore, on certain counts, USA was held responsible, found to be responsible in breach of international obligation as far as the judgment by International Court of Justice is concerned. But on certain other counts, it could not satisfy as it applied or as it went, as it went on to apply effective control test. Now, as opposed to effective a control test, we also see there is another test which is known as overall control test. Now, friends, overall control test is a test wherein we see that individuals are held responsible for the acts. Now, we know that if there is a group of force or if there is a battalion and there is hierarchy in the battalion, then the leader of the battalion, the colonel or the major or the officer of the battalion would not directly go at all places and commit genocide, war crimes or crimes against humanity. It might give a particular order and then in order to fulfill that particular objective of the order given by the officer, the members of the battalion, the foot soldiers would might enter into commission of certain wrongful acts which might amount to genocide, which might amount to war crime or which might amount to crimes against humanity. So, even if a particular officer is not directly involved in commission of grave breaches or international crimes, then also that particular officer, that particular commander, general, etc., whatever may be the post can be held responsible for the wrongful acts that it has committed. In such scenario, there might not be exact actual instruction which is given to that to, to the foot soldiers to the to the force to the individual soldiers who are carrying out the orders but then there is an overall control so based on this particular argument overall test is applied in individual cases in individual criminal responsibility and this was identified in tadich case because in trials chamber when tadich was tried effective control test was applied which was criticized by appellate chamber and they said we cannot apply the same rule that is applied for the state responsibility in individual responsibility. For individual criminal responsibility, we need to apply overall control test that, 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 that is there must be an overall control over the battalion, over the forces that are executing the 
orders or that are executing the instructions. The instruction may be general in nature and may not be specific, but if you look at the state responsibility, the instructions must be specific. The control has to be more intense as far as laying down of a state responsibility is concerned. So, we see effective control test to be made applicable in case we need to establish that the conduct is directed or controlled by a particular state. Now, apart from this, there is another case that is USA versus Islamic Republic of Iran 1980. Here also we see that it was not the state forces that were directly involved in the commission of internationally wrongful act against US embassy, it were private citizens. However, it was the duty of Iran to protect the personnel, agents of United States of America and the embassy. Since the premises is inviolable, since the movement of the consuls the movement of diplomats was violated since the archives and property was caused destruction. So, where such a breach under Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Law or on Consular Relations comes into being or comes before us, it then can be said that Iran was at fault in that particular case on the grounds and on the basis that there was omission. There was no direct act as such, but there was omission as far as the whole embassy incident is concerned. So, we see that a state is under responsibility to protect also, where in Iran case, US versus Iran case, Iran was under a duty to protect, which it did not comply with as per the judgment of International Court of Justice and therefore, they were held responsible. Article 9 talks about conduct carried out in the absence or default of the official authorities. The conduct of a person or group of persons shall be considered an act of a state under international law if the person or group of persons is in fact exercising elements of the governmental authority. In the absence or default of the official authorities and in circumstances such as to call for the exercise of those elements of authority. When governmental authorities act in good faith and without negligence, general principle is of non-liability for actions of rioters or rebels causing loss or damage. The state is however under a duty to show due diligence. Article 10 says, where an insurrectional movement is successful either in becoming the new government of a state or in establishing a new state in part of territory of the pre-existing state it will be held responsible for its activities prior to its assumption of authority. We can identify the application of Article 10 in Iran US Claims Tribunal, short versus the Islamic Republic of Iran, wherein it was not established that revolutionaries had control over territory and government demonstrated its loss of control. Acts of supporters cannot be attributed. So, when this claims tribunal was established, there were certain number of claims that were brought before the tribunal, individual claims by US citizens against the state of Iran. We see that in short verses Islamic Republic of Iran, the control was not found and since the state was not in control and since a state cannot be assumed to be in control, because if you look at the case wherein we see the breach or viability uh, violation of the embassy premises, wherein we see the violation of embassy premises, uh, the, the consular staff being detained and the destruction of archives and the property of the embassy, therein the state was in a position, the responsibility was much higher as compared to the responsibility that we are talking about here. In claims tribunal, we see or we have to look at the fact that whether the state was in control to protect, only then we can say that a state has not complied with its duty. Otherwise, a state will not be counted for its breach of duty. Whereas, in other case that is eager versus the Islamic Republic of Iran, we see compensation was awarded for expulsion as expulsion was carried out by the revolutionary guards after the success of revolution. And as we know, the revolutionary guards 
were acting on behalf of the governmental authority, not expressly but certainly impliedly as they took part in the insurrectional movement and they succeeded later on and they afterwards took over control of all the governmental public functions. Article 11 says that if the state subsequently adopts, acknowledges conduct as its own, it entails responsibility, even though such conduct was not attributable to the state beforehand. In, in Iranian hostage case, we see international court noted that initial acts cannot be imputable since they were not agents of a state, but subsequent approval by Ayatollah Khomeini and other organs of Iran and decision to maintain the occupation of embassy translated that act into a state act. Militants became agents and a state bore international responsibility. Now, this is, these are certain important provisions that we see as far as imputation of a state responsibility is concerned. But then we can also see, look at the provisions or we will look at the provisions which precludes the wrongfulness. So, up to article 11 or beyond that also we have certain provisions, but due to paucity of time, we will look at only up to article 11 of the articles of state responsibility, which tries to entail international responsibility upon state. However, these international responsibilities that we have just talked about can be precluded under certain defenses. What are those? Circumstances precluding wrongfulness. Article 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 and 25 talks about circumstances precluding wrongfulness. Article 20 talks about consent. So, wherever a state, let us say, has given its consent as far as any wrongful act is concerned, then based on that valid consent, we can say that the state deemed to be responsible will not be or alleged to be responsible cannot be held to be responsible. So, it can take defense of consent that the other state who is claiming the wrongful act against me has given a valid consent. So, it says valid consent by a state to the commission of a given act by another state precludes the wrongfulness of that act in relation to the former state to the extent that the act remains within the limits of that consent. Example of which can be troops sent to another state. So, if troops are sent by state A into state B and within state B, if they commit an internationally wrongful act, the state A can then take the defense that state B has given the consent of receiving the troops. Article 21 talks about self-defense. Now, this preclusion of wrongfulness is also available in United Nations Charter. So, there also an act of aggression is prohibited. However, use of force in self-defense is allowed. So, here self-defense says the wrongfulness of an act of a state is precluded if the act constitutes a lawful measure of self-defense taken in conformity with the charter of the United Nations. ILC commentary says that is International Law Commission commentary says the fact that an act is taken in self-defense does not necessarily mean that all wrongfulness is precluded since the principles of human rights and humanitarian law have to be respected. Self-defense does not mean going abroad or this leading to destruction of property and the collateral damage is no more a collateral, but the main damage. So, such actions should be avoided. Self-defense also is circumscribed by certain limitations. Article 22 allows for countermeasures in respect of an internationally wrongful act. It says, the wrongfulness of an act of a state not in conformity with an international obligation towards another state is precluded if and to the extent that the act constitutes a countermeasure taken against the later state in accordance with chapter 2 of part 3. Now, chapter 2 of part 3 is given from article 49 to article 52. It says that if there is any kind of countermeasure that is taken, it must be proportional in nature. It must be only to allow other state to stop the wrongful acts committed against a particular state. So, if a state A has committed a wrongful act against a state B and the wrongful action is still in continuation, a state B can take countermeasure of similar nature which must be proportional and which must not go over the board that is go beyond what has been committed by a state A. So, it must be in proportion and the objective of countermeasure should only be to allow the other state to come to reach back to the same position as it was before and stop the wrongful action against state B. 
Article 23 precludes the wrongful actions under force measure and it says the wrongfulness of an act of a state not in conformity with an international obligation of that state is precluded if the act is due to force measure. That is the occurrence of an irresistible force or of an unforeseen event beyond the control of the state making it materially impossible in the circumstances to perform the obligation. Paragraph 1 does not apply if the situation of force majeure is due either alone or in combination with other factors to the conduct of the state invoking it or the state has assumed the risk of that situation occurring. Article 24 talks about distress. The wrongfulness of an act of a state not in conformity with an international obligation of that state is precluded if the author of the act in question has no other reasonable way in a situation of distress of saving the author's life or the lives of other persons entrusted to the author's care. Again, paragraph 1 does not apply if the situation of distress is due either alone or in combination with other factors to the conduct of the state invoking it or the act in question is likely to create a comparable or greater peril. Article 25 talks about necessity and says necessity may not be invoked by a state as a ground for precluding, precluding the wrongfulness of an act not in conformity with an international obligation of that state unless the act clause A is the only way for the state to safeguard an essential interest against a grave and imminent peril and does not seriously impair an essential interest of the state or states towards which the obligation exists or of the international community as a whole. Two, in any case, necessity may not be invoked by a state as a ground for precluding wrongfulness if the international obligation in question excludes the possibility of invoking necessity or the state has contributed to the situation of necessity. So, these are the methods or these are the headings under which a state can preclude any wrongful act. Okay. Now, apart from this, once we see that wrongful act has been identified, wrongful act has been committed by a particular state the adjudicating body finalizes that yes, a particular state against which claim for or allegation for internationally wrongful acts are satisfied, then internationally resp international responsibility is proved, then you impose liability. Now, what is the recourse after liability? How to satisfy, how to um, fulfill that particular liability? So, articles of a state responsibility also identifies through customary practices and on its own discussions and at uh, international law commission um, meetings, the reparation mode through which a state can be sufficed or satisfied with as far as any internationally or uh, wrongful act is concerned. So, reparation for the injury has been discussed under article 35, 36 and 37. 35 talks about restitution and it says a state responsible for an internationally wrongful act is under an obligation to make restitution that is to re-establish the situation which existed before the wrongful act was committed. So, reinstating the same position would amount to restitution provided and to the extent that restitution is not materially impossible does not involve a burden out of all proportion to the benefit deriving from restitution instead of compensation. The second one would be compensation and the third one would be satisfaction. The compensation should be as per the damage caused and as far as satisfaction is concerned, states tend to place an apology, states tend to assure the other state that they will not repeat their acts in future. So, through this we see reparation for injury can be maintained. So, this is a holistic idea as far as articles of a state responsibility is concerned under which we can see how states can be made responsible and how they can pay for the wrongful acts that they had committed. So, this will be all about state responsibility. I thank you for your patient listening. Namaskar.